20 years ago, the Legg family took over this farm in West Dorset. Almost immediately, they discovered that one end of this field was difficult to plough, and they put it down to the stony soil. But then, earlier this year, Roman finds started to crop up all over the field. Roof tile, pottery, Roman coins, brooches. What's going on? The legs are itching to know. Is there a Roman building here that could account for their broken ploughs? Time Team's got just three days to find out and let them know. Geophys have been at it since dawn. We're also metal detecting and walking the field. There's enough space between the maize plants to look for more Roman pot or tile just lying on the surface. If finds are clustering, we can investigate the hot spots. But the truth is, we're sticking in a trench on a broad scatter of metal detectorist finds and outside the Geophys survey area. I wonder if our spectators have got any idea of how close to disaster we are. So what we do then is we'll, we'll strip a bit of an area yeah. rather than just going straight down. That's right. Strip an area it, yeah. and then try in it. In case there's still stuff in the, in the top right, soil. we'll okay. do that. Is that a bit of a figure there? Well, that could be, couldn't it? Could Our be. Roman double act, Guy and Richard, have been looking at what kind of Roman coins have been found to see if the dates and values give us any clues as to why they were here. Do we reckon we know what we've got now? Yep, quite a few coins. Yes, I know we've got coins. Even I know we've got coins. What kind of date? Early second, speeding up in the third, quite a lot of fourth century stuff. Are they valuable? In ancient terms, no. So what does that imply? You'd either use them for everyday purchase on market stalls or fairgrounds or something like that and not worry if you lost them, or if you're giving them to a shrine or something, the tendency is always to give the worst stuff, the copies, the forgeries, the foreign coins. So lots of finds but no structure? Yeah, we've got a real mystery. The coins are great, the brooches are great. It's a very, very strange place. May as well call in the wrinkled professor while we're at it. <laughs> I'm worried when you have a stern no. face. We got, we got what looks like our natural look coming yeah. on there. But look, there's some looks coming round here and we appear to have an edge. What I was requesting is to take out a bit of this. Yeah, take out a bit more. And, and see whether or not we can. I mean, this if this is a, a ditch or something like this coming round, yeah. put you a need slot. to see that natural, the other side. That's why it's exactly what I'm yeah. saying. OK, let's do that. What Phil thinks he's got is a man-made ditch cut into the natural geology. He's found one edge, and to confirm it, he needs to find the other one. Oh, nice that's the other side of it then. Nice one. We now have two edges to our ditch. Just outside the ditch, Matt has been exploring an area where detectorists have found a cluster of coins. And it's produced something rather interesting. Matt, mm -hmm. you see I've got this kind of black circle thing here. Yeah. I think we should get um, a metal detector or something over them. Can we borrow you for a minute? Sweep over these two. It's not very promising, no. is it? Ah. Oi! Well, if you dig it out in chunks from yeah. a good distance away and then break out a big lump, we'll get Will to go over the chunks that we take out. Yeah. Ah, I see. So it's in there somewhere. So now we just, if we just split it up into two or three, yeah. and then Will can go over each bit. So let's spread that out a bit. Ah. Hey! There you go. Look I find, I find. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely oh, excellent. fine. Mark! Come and have a look at this, mate. Got another one. Oh, yes. Can you tell anything about that, or does it need to be cleaned up? Well, it's going to be either late 3rd or 4th century AD. How do you like know the, that? The size and thickness alone, that, that's enough to, to give a good indication. So what are all these Roman coins doing in a prehistoric site? The answer is not in Roger's mysterious shadowy square. Bridget has found only geology, so his bolts must have been sheared by plain old rocks. 
Even though everyone's bottling up their feelings, it's been a tense and frustrating day for the archaeologists. Nerves are beginning to fray, particularly when one of the crew steps into Phil's newly cleaned trench. Uh, David! Sorry, sir. And on the other side of the hedge, the hunt for the all-important centre of the barrow is also proving frustrating. No one can agree where it is. I'll pace it and I think that's where the centre is. K for carry? Yeah, not a chance. Yeah. We'll mark the perimeter and we'll see who's right. Well, well, I'm, I'm going to extend it from the trench bit. And oh, see. you do what you want. <laughs> Stand there, you know. Oh, yeah, it's so fine. <laughs> what length you got? 24. There. Centre. Centre. Two centres then. Two, Two centres. centres. Got three different you points. were right <laughs> mardy this morning I about this site, yeah. weren't you? Yeah. I'm never very good in the morning. <laughs> no, but about this site, you were going, oh, I don't know if there's anything here. I think, I think it was quite a sort of high risk thing, actually. You know, we had a, a group of fines and a few other finds that might or might not have been, you know, Roman tile and so on. And it seemed a lot to, <laughs> to base the, you know, the work on. It seems to have paid off this time. Well, it does, yeah, it does. <laughs> Look at that. What's, your, what's going on over there? Guys, I don't know why you're squabbling. We're going to be digging a trench about five by five. It really doesn't matter whether the centre's on Kerry's point, on Henry's point or on John's point. What matters is, are we going to find anything in it? We'll know tomorrow. Beginning of day two, yesterday we found this beautiful Bronze Age ditch, which the archaeologists are saying ought to be part of a burial mound. So yesterday evening we projected where the rest of the curve of the ditch should be so that we could excavate the centre of it and hopefully find the burial. But this being time team, there's a fly in the ointment. Mick, come here, what's the problem? Well, when I was up in the crane last night when everybody else had gone home, looking down on the site, it seemed to me that this curve of the ditch that we got here like that yeah. was actually wider than what we've projected in the field next door but we had three guys working that out last night so they all got it wrong well they may not have got it wrong it just looked different from above and yeah. it, it worried me that we might be basing where the ditch was and basing therefore where the middle was on you know it just didn't look right even though everyone's bottling up their feelings it's been a tense and frustrating day for the archaeologists Nerves are beginning to fray, particularly when one of the crew steps into Phil's newly clean trench. Uh, David! Sorry, sir. Oh. Phil, can we walk across your lovely ditch? Yeah, that's all right, Tony. Mark! Yes. You got something for us? Yes, Tony. At the end of yesterday, having cleaned back in this area, scanned by uh, one of the metal detector users, and we got these three little shallow scoops and in the bottom of each one, a Roman coin. Wow! It's a third and fourth century AD. So do you think these were actually put into those holes deliberately? Yes. So not only have we found a new Bronze Age barrow, perhaps 4,000 years old, but also the first evidence of Roman veneration for a prehistoric monument in this part of Britain, 2,000 years later. On the other side of the hedge, the search is now on for more sections of the ring ditch, to get a fix on where the centre of the barrow is. That's crucial because it's where you'd find a burial in a classic monument from the Bronze Age. To get to the bottom of its history, Phil's been cutting vertically down through the stuff that filled the original ditch. And he's very pleased with his work. I think that is an absolutely impeccably cut section. That will be so plumb people will write books about it. Even though the mound itself has been ploughed away, bits of Bronze Age pot are circumstantial evidence of cremation burials in a classic barrow. It's one of the practices that arrived in Britain in the Bronze Age. At the bottom of Phil's beautiful little trench, there are some mysterious features which are exciting miles. You see we've got these, like, almost like post holes oh, right. and post pipes in each section, look. 
Yeah, they made quite, quite clear as post holes. We were just debating whether that's the sort of thing you'd expect to get. You do in, in quite a few uh, later Bronze Age and indeed early Bronze Age barrows, the ditch acts as a palisade trench. So you've effectively secured the timbers right at the base of the ditch uh, and the soil's then piled up around them. This is intriguing. A palisade around a barrow is definitely not a common feature of Bronze Age monuments. We've revealed most of the ring ditch on the other side of the hedge. Now we can try to work out where the centre is and whatever it might hold. We're also still looking for possible Roman reuse of the barrow. Remember those Romans who brought us here? I mean, that's got to be late Neolithic or early Bronze Age, I would have thought. Really? Amazingly, to an expert like Phil, a stone tool can be dating evidence. The trimming on this scraper suggests skilled craftsmanship from the Neolithic or Stone Age. Perfect thing to hold in your head. <laughs> These skills were largely lost in the Bronze Age when metal replaced stone tools. It may add yet another thousand years to our monument, and that would definitely account for the odd features. Is it true that he wasn't that interested in archaeology until we came along? That's right, absolutely true. <laughs> Can't keep them away now. <laughs> so is it part of an entrance complex? Uh, definitely not, no. No, no looking at it, it's, it's starting to worry me whether it's actually some kind of quarry, because the sides of it are extremely irregular. Right. And there's not an awful lot of material in it either. I see, so they've used that to actually make the mound. That would be a nice assumption to make, actually. So one oddity explained, but there's another in the barrow itself. Bridge and Ian are investigating an intriguing area of the ring ditch, which has clearly been filled with burnt material. The thing about this ring that's amazing is the finds that are coming out. They're coming out left, right and centre, and it's Ian who's really finding them, and I'm just looking at him jealous as anything. <laughs> what have you got? Well, he's just finding all these tools here. Cool. Look at them all. I mean, we've got, he's got this one here, wonderful thing. It's a scraper. He used to scrape off hides and things like that. There's this one here. That's another scraping edge. He's found there. this one here. <laughs> There's all sorts of things. We've also found some pottery in here. Absolutely brilliant stuff. This one here. You can have a thumb decoration there or a lug that's fallen off. What kind of period do you reckon this is? Well, I'd go for Bronze Age, but very early Bronze Age. Maybe transitional. I think you're probably about right, and I think one of the really good key indicator that sort of provoked discussion is from this piece of pottery here, where it's a rim, and it's got whipcord decoration. What do you mean by that? Well, can you see here? You've got, like, a piece of string has been pressed into the wet clay before it was dried. The string decoration would have been applied before this massive collared urn was fired, about 4,000 years ago. Absolutely wonderful. It's just the most exciting trench I've worked on, I don't know for how long. Do we know much about these Neolithic people? Well, we're really dealing with the, the first agriculturalists, the first farmers, the first builders of monuments uh, in the Neolithic. Uh, prior to the Neolithic, we just got sort of hunters and gatherers, not really having much of an impact, but the Neolithic farmers are the first people who start building things, big monuments in the landscape, cutting down trees, ploughing fields. What sort of date? Well, it, it dates from around about 4000 BC. So our monument's at the tail end of it, it's about 3000 BC. Can we work out anything about them as people? Um, we, we can. We, actually, finding the, the skeletal evidence is often quite rare. We find bits of bodies, but we don't find complete individuals. And that might be what our, our monument is. It might be a place where bodies are left to decompose and then selected pieces are taken away for burial elsewhere. Do you find many monuments like this around here? Not around here, no. no. So this is actually quite rare. It fills in a nice gap uh, in our Neolithic map. We appear to have lurched more than 3,000 years back in time since we arrived at the site. Poor old Victor has been struggling to keep up with this archaeological mystery tour. It's not that long since he rubbed out the Romans. Right, oh wow. Well, hello, Victor. Well, that's a lovely drawing of a Bronze Age round mound. Um, I've got a bit of bad news, though, I'm afraid. No. Uh, we, <laughs> material that's coming up now looks uh, Neolithic. So I oh. think we've added about a thousand years onto the date of the, the mound. Redrawing is in order then? <coughs> uh, yeah. Yes, re redesign I'm afraid. And as far as the activity is concerned, what would they be...? <laughs> well, that, that, that is the um, six million dollar question really. What is going on inside? Our evidence for a number of these sites is you get bits of human remains in the ditch. Right. And one suggestion is this is a, an exposure burial site where oh. bodies decompose 
probably not the sort of the nicest of pictures to do, but possibly uh, yeah. bodies decomposing in the centre uh, and bits rolling off into the ditches. Wow. <laughs> Stewart's come up with yet another piece of evidence that supports Miles' theory that this may be a Neolithic site. It's all to do with the visibility of the site from the surrounding countryside. This landscape has just thrown some real surprises in here. This model here shows, the green shows the, the high ground and the other colours show the low ground where the monument can't be seen. So it's there. So essentially, you can see it when you're some way away, but when you're near, it's invisible. That, it, that's a very Neolithic thing to do, to uh, get seclusion. You're not wanting to show off to the landscape, you're actually wanting sort of privacy around it, and our site has got that quality. If you look where the rivers are, here, we've put the rivers on this 3D view of the site there. It's like in the middle of the circle of all those rivers, isn't it? It, it is, and it's actually sitting right in that triangle of them. Again, typical Neolithic thing, putting monuments close to watersheds and sources of rivers. This site has produced one of the biggest range of finds we've ever seen on Time Team. From 5,000-year-old Neolithic church tools to 500-year-old medieval coins, there's something from every period. And together, they've unlocked the secrets of this site. We came here looking for a Roman temple and instead found what we thought was a classic Bronze Age barrow. But it's now clear that our thing began its life in the Neolithic about 5,000 years ago, as an enclosure ringed by a ditch and quite possibly by a palisade which was later burnt. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. This is Manchester City Centre, and behind all these posh shops lies a story that changed Britain and the world. And it's all down to this stuff, cotton. It's only just over 200 years ago that cotton cloth started to be manufactured in this country and Manchester soon became the powerhouse and driving force behind the new cotton industry. The building at the heart of this story lies here in the city centre and it revolutionised British society. Built in 1780, on this spot was the first cotton mill in Manchester. Today, it's buried under this car park, and we've got just three days to locate and retrieve one of the most important historic sites in Britain. Not that you'd know it today. Francis, if there was a mill here, they've managed to wipe out every single piece of evidence of it. Well, not actually, Tony. Behind you there, you can see you've got cobbles. Now, I think that was the surface of the yard that went outside the mill. That's certainly early 19th century cobbles. So presumably then, Mike, the front of the mill was run along those cobbles. Yes, Francis, we've actually got a number of maps. This is one from 1831, and it shows the mill as a rectangular building with a reservoir below it, and then the cobbles running in between. If we know that, then why are we bothering to dig the site? Because although this is a factory that's been used for 150 years, Tony, we don't know how the mill was laid out, we don't know how it develops. But digging one rectangular building isn't going to take three days, is it? Not one building, it's been rebuilt a number of times. Right. Burnt down in the 1850s, for instance. So how are we going to locate it? Well, you see, we've had a bit of a deliberation about this. The obvious one would be to whack a trench right through the middle of it, but we, we really want to find out a bit more about how well preserved it is, where the, the width of it is. So what we're going to do is just pop one in through there. That will give us the precise width of the walls, it will give us the location of the walls, and it will give us some idea of the depth of deposits as well. You seem quite excited about I am, this. I am. Your passion is prehistory. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is the prehistory of the Industrial Revolution. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Arkwright created two cutting-edge systems for the mill. The first was a steam engine to power the mill directly, something no one else had yet achieved. The second was an innovative water system that used a steam engine together with a water wheel. We hope to find evidence of both systems near the centre of the mill. But to find this, we need to find the mill's walls. Even though we've got various plans, they aren't reliable. 
So the diggers will place trench one here, which they hope will stretch across one side of the original mill. The site hasn't been developed since the Blitz of 1940, when a mill rebuilt in the Victorian era was destroyed by the Luftwaffe. Because of the hard modern tarmac, the Geophys team can't stick their normal sensors in the ground. Instead, they're using radar to cover the whole mill area, which will take them all day. Within an hour of stripping the surface, Phil thinks he's hit the jackpot. Kerry, this is it. This is the wall of the mill house. We've got the yard out there, and here's the wall, and then inside the mill. Let's see a bit more of this wall here. If Phil has hit the wall of Arkwright's 1780s mill, he's uncovered a building at the root of massive change in Manchester, a building that helped transform a village into a metropolis. As day one nears an end, we're still not sure if Phil's walls are Arkwright, but Mike's confident of the date of the wall in Trench 3. Well, we stopped digging and starting the recording. What's happened here? Well, what we've got here, Tony, is we've got the end of the mill. Uh, we've got the cobbles here, yeah. and then we've got a, a line of bricks. They're a bit bashed about by a couple of holes which have been bashed through in the mid-20th century, but either side we have brick walling. You see there's got two rows of bricks here, and then a row of bricks and some stone sets over here, and we think that's the doorway into the mill. You say it's the doorway into the mill, but earlier ah. you said to me there were lots of mills at different times. There are lots of mills. now. We're pretty certain this is Arkwright's 1781-82 mill. Why? This is a brick from 1854. It's very sharp, it's wire-cut, and it's quite chunky, very nicely made. However, that is a brick from this wall. Much, much more irregular. It's made in a wooden mould. It's a slightly smaller si a size, and it's far more irregular. And this was made in Manchester between 1780 and 1820. This is the brick from Arkwright's first mill. I bet you're glad you found that. Absolutely delighted. So, Matt, what are we going to do with this trench now? Well, that's it, really, Tony. It's job done here. But we have got a bonus, in the, and we've got to the end of the trench, we've got this huge stone column base here. And if you look closely, you can see the, the circle there where the cast iron flange would have been at the bottom of the column, and these would have run all the way down the centre of the mill there. So, pre presumably, that's proof positive that we're right inside the factory? Absolutely. By the end of the day, we've found at least one piece of original Arkwright wall and we're uncovering possible sites for the engine. And there's a whole other side of the story yet to explore. For you, this dig isn't just about some old bits of machinery, is it? No, it's about the really terrible lives of the people that worked in the mill and lived right in its shadow. In fact, over there, there were some buildings that we think had cellar dwellings underneath them where the people may have actually lived. We're going to look at those tomorrow. Should be some good finds there, shouldn't there? I hope there? so. But in addition to that, we've started work on this trench here, which is going to be huge. And already we've come up with this really interesting arch here. So tomorrow, we're not only going to try and get into the hearts and minds of the people who lived here, but into the heart of the factory that dominated their lives. These, these are the same type as this, which would make them Arkwright as well. Well, you know, words, the whole thing is Arkwright. Yeah. I mean, there's no question, that wall there is later than that wall. It sits on the, on the plinth there. Hmm. Confused, so are we. Suddenly, Mike and Phil realise that 1780 bricks may not mean a 1780 wall. So this arch may be nothing to do with Arkwright's engine. Worse, all the dating they've done on the walls of the mill so far is thrown into question. Now, I think we do have a little bit of Arkwright here, and that's these column bases. You can see there's one there, another one there, yeah. and another one coming up there. Arkwright used to use column bases to run down the centre of his buildings. So that gives us the alignment, because we've also found one in that little trench over there. This tiny little thing here, yeah. That's right, and that also had the only bit of Arkwright wall that I'm prepared to swear by. Right. Now, you can see where those two ladies have obligingly stood. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> They're down the centre of the building. Yeah. And then the other one is over there yeah. by the genuine Arkwright wall. Now, what we do know is that Arkwright's buildings were 30 feet wide. If the columns are going down the middle, 
If we measure out 15 feet on either side, we'll get where the walls ought to be. So do we do that? Yeah, you can come and help me, come on. Grab the tape. Yeah. Pop in next door to that column. Yeah. From the middle of the column? Uh, the middle of the column. Right. Here we go, 15 feet. Right. So the wall by rights ought to be here. And there's solid brick all over it. Uh, yes, that's a slight problem, isn't it? What we'll do is look underneath them just to make sure that there is wall there. And if we are on the money there? It's Arkwright's Mill. So we... Bridge has made great progress on her Angel Street house, revealing nearly a complete cellar dwelling in just a couple of hours. Victorian reports from Frederick Engels and others describe the hardships of living and working in the mills of the area. One of our team, Stuart, has got a personal insight into what mill life would have been like. His mother worked in a mill near Leeds. I remember how little money we had in those early days, and uh, I can remember hiding from the rent man when we were, because when we were a bit short on a Monday night, we used to, we used to have to keep quiet and the lights were turned down because the rent man was expected and things like that. It's weird because whenever we talk about mill life, it seems like it was another era. It's amazing to me that you, who a relatively young bloke... Thank you. <laughs> ..still remember it. Well, I do. I grew, I grew up with it. My, my mother was a weaver, worked in, in the weaving sheds all her life. She was incredibly physically strong. She worked eight looms at once but had to keep them all going the whole time. So incredibly hard physical work. You know, one of the historians told me, and I thought this was so extraordinary, that all those northern comedians who used to speak like that with all those <laughs> gestures, they actually did it, not as an affectation, but because virtually all of them worked in the mills and it was so noisy there yeah. that they continually had to do all that elaborate communication, otherwise no one would ever understand what they were saying. Yeah, and I can actually remember you know, the, the looms turning, the noise, the workforce, the people. And one thing I remember about the loss of my mum's friends, um, the weavers, is that they, they'd lost fingers. Because uh, when the shuttle was going backwards and forwards, you had to catch it and turn it round. And if you didn't get it right, it took your finger off. And I remember a lot of my mum's friends all, all sort of missing the odd end of their finger or a finger missing and things like that. So injury and deafness and hard work were all part of a, a weaver's life. Beginning of day three, and guess what? It's raining in Manchester. Mind you, it would have been pretty wet here 220 odd years ago when Richard Arkwright built his mill, because we're pretty sure the whole thing was powered by water and steam. Not that we've found that much of the factory, because every time we've got anywhere near it, it miraculously seems to disappear through our fingers, isn't it? So, are you really confident? that we actually do have the water wheel here. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, hooray, hooray, hooray. And yet you've been found wanting so many times over the last 48 hours. Why are you so sure? Well, all the maps tell us the water wheel was in this position here where we stood. We've seen it on the radar plan, but if you're not convinced, look at this vertical section. There's the top of the ground. That red line marks that road surface. Below that road surface is this clear response. That has to be the wheel pit. And does it work for you in terms of the logic of the architecture? It does, Tony, because we're in the middle of the mill, and that, in an half track mill, is where the water wheel will be. So why is it so significant that we find this wheel? Well, it will tie everything down. Yeah, I mean, if you know the position of the water wheel, it transfers the energy via a shaft into the mill, and once you know the position of that, you can work out where all the looms are, how many there will be. The whole layout is dependent on finding that. Back on site, the hunt for the wheel pit isn't going quite as planned. Francis, can I remind you of an exchange earlier on today? Tony, are you confident <laughs> that there is a water wheel in this trench? You four? Yes, 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 yes. Hello, water wheel, where are you? It's not there. Uh, it's turned out to be a little bit more complicated than that, Tony. <laughs> Is it? Uh, yeah. In fact, it's, it, it's all happening as we speak. <laughs> Phil down there has got something, and I don't know what it is. He won't tell us. Francis! Yeah? Got it! Really? Yes! Yards away, Phil's now uncovered the thing that ran under the wall. <laughs> Come and have a look. 
Oh, heck. What do you think of that, then? <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting that. Oh. It's a 20th century drain. Well, I'm completely gobsmacked. <laughs> I reckon we might actually finally have this well pit, you know. That is deep. <laughs> that is deep. How deep are you now? Well, I did dangle a tape over there and it was 12 foot, so it's supposed to be 15 foot, so I'm, I'm my money's on three more foot. And that's eight that, feet wide? That's eight foot wide, yeah. so bang on the money for that one. And we didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> all the walls down there, all four of them, appear to be lined in this stuff, and, and, and it's all the way round. Well, that looks like that pitch or bitumen, but that's the ceiling. That's right, then presumably that hole was designed to take water. That's going to protect the brickwork. Yeah, it would have to be watertight. So that could mean that's a well. What if this is the very first steam engine he installed, the 1781 one, which was meant to be running the machinery? That would have to be in the middle of the mill, like a water wheel, to run the machinery. It failed, but instead of building a new engine, they adapted it as a pumping engine. That, that would mean that we found our 1781 engine and, it, and, and it, under our very noses. It was here all the time. <laughs> OK. OK, thanks, Mike. <laughs> it's deep. It's massive, isn't it? <laughs> all right, so if the wheel was in there, what about the steam? Come over here. We now think this is the site of Arkwright's 1781 steam engine he tried to use to power textile machinery. But if that was his very first engine, that was the one that didn't work properly. It so, was. So why is it still here? Well, it was positioned in the middle of the mill so it could run the line shafting to power the textile machinery that way. Yeah. It didn't work, so what it looks like they've done is they've reused it for pumping water from the lower reservoir through the well there and out onto a spillway into channels running that way. Somebody has tried to apply steam to textile machinery. So this isn't just archaeology, this is history. This is where the modern world begins. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. In 1534, Henry VIII visited this manor house in Buckinghamshire, the first of many visits by the King and his daughter Elizabeth. But the owner knew that the royals expected only the biggest and the best, so he had his home transformed into a palace. But magnificent though this Tudor building is, it's hardly big enough to support the king and his entourage of over 300 courtiers. It must have been at least twice this big. So where's the rest of it? And what exactly does it take to build a house fit for a king. As usual, we've got just three days to find out. A historical document mentions a wing measuring nine chambers from the church to a gatehouse. This could either run along the north or the east of the courtyard, with either one containing the grand gatehouse entrance. Jonathan's preferred option is two wings with the gatehouse to the east, giving us a palace large enough for a king and his entourage. We're talking about a house that Henry VIII visited and Elizabeth, up to a thousand people descending on it for periods up to a couple of weeks or, or more. It must have been a very big complex with lots of supporting structures. Mm. So my neat vision might be much more complex in reality. Mick, how do we explode Jonathan's cosy vision of what this place would have looked like? Well, I think we can look the two wings that are on there that, are, that don't exist today. We can have a look at those by putting some trenches across and see if there is any walls in the bottom of them. But of course, the building itself is a piece of archaeology and it's full just by looking around the outside of, of, of clues of where walls have joined on, windows have been altered. So there's a sort of three-dimensional jigsaw to sort out of the building itself. Absolutely isn't there? there is, yeah. <laughs> I want to know what the difference is going to be between this painting and what we finally come up yeah. with. Let's get on then. And so our first trench goes in based on Jonathan's recreation. Here on the proposed eastern wing, close to where he believes there was a grand gatehouse. You're a bit previous, aren't you? We haven't even got the GFS results yet. Yeah, but I, I don't think it'll matter, actually. We've got a lot of clues as to what might be going on here. We know about these two wings. We can see where that step is there by the, by the fire yeah. alarm. 
There's different sorts of brickwork there, aren't there? There's all sorts of stuff going on. We're going to have to spend a lot of time looking at that, because it, it, for now, it just tells us something's coming off in this direction. As well as rediscovering this structure and the rest of the palace, we hope to find out why much of this complex disappeared over the centuries, because historical records show it was large and grand enough to play host to Henry three times and Elizabeth twice, a place where they and their entourage could rest, feast and hunt. The house's high status was due to one man, the first Earl of Bedford, John Russell, who had a meteoric rise through the Tudor court. He was in the service of a man called Sir Richard Jerningham, who was one of Wolsey's key officials. Now, what's important about that is that when Jerningham died, um, Sir John Russell not only, if you like, stepped into Jerningham's job, he also stepped into his bed, he married his widow. <laughs> that was and Anne that, Sapcott, Sapcott, who inherited Cheney's. And that's how he got Cheney's. But that coincided with Henry VIII taking Russell into the Privy Chamber. He was a gentleman of the Privy Chamber in 1526. Now, he was one of only eight people in the country who were allowed to touch the king, and even one of those eight, the barber, was only allowed to touch him when the king specifically invited him to do so. So Russell is one of those very key courtiers at the very heart of the Tudor court. So really, you could say that Russell was one of the eight most important men in the country at that time. Absolutely. Now, but what Henry also does is um, he gives him a wedding present, and he gives him the manor of Amersham next door. And that gives him the money to build a chainers. Oh, crikey, yeah, look that? at that. It looks like we've got... See, that is a mortar surface there. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's the yeah. holes in the yeah. ground that will confirm floor, or sink Jonathan's the theory. You must be inside a building. Hang it's... on, why do you say that that's a floor? It's, it's, a, it's a laid mortar surface. It's very compact. It's evenly distributed. It's laid on these bits of these brick surface. It may have had a tiled floor actually on the top yeah. of it, yeah. which they lifted off, but that was, what you're looking at is actual foundation surface for a, a, a floor, I think. And they've got but something else over there, haven't they? Now, this is really the good stuff. Look, we've got this, these mortar bricks in here, but look, it's bang on line That's with the end of the wing. Lines up exactly where we want it. it to be. Why yeah. couldn't that be 21st century? It could be. I mean, there's still a lot of demolition rubble about it, but that, that looks to me, that looks to me Tudorish. I mean, one, one, pe one piece yeah. of pot yeah, does not right. make a, a period. Yeah. But it, I would have thought we could be looking at, at that sort of period. It's almost like that Cistercian weir, isn't it? Which is that sort of very dark green stuff, you know. Yeah, I think it's fine. Well, there's our first bit of Tudor. Very good. Early days yet, Tony? Yeah. The evidence does suggest this wall is Tudor which, going by Jonathan's theory, means we should be close to the sort of grand gatehouse you'd expect at the entrance to a royal residence. But just as one piece of pot doesn't make a period, one wall doesn't make a wing. So we're putting in another trench to find the other side of our possible gatehouse wing. Trench 2 has also come up with the goods, and it's even more substantial than the wall in Phil's trench. Yeah. <laughs> hey, well, that's wallish, isn't it's it? very wallish. <laughs> We've got the wall up here, and we've even got some flint footings, which, you know... Fairly typical, aren't they? Local resources, chalk and flint. Absolutely, Good, Good yep. for the Chilterns, yeah. Not only does this feature line up with the existing Tudor wall by the church, yep. there's even some traces of plaster on it, suggesting this could be the inside of our northern wing. Here's our Tudor wall, and that does line up exactly yeah. on the end of the building. We still don't really know whether we are in a building or, as this material here, this gravel material, might suggest that we're actually into a courtyard surface. The other problem, of course, is that we've got these walls here and we don't know, again, whether they're a building or whether they're garden features. The trouble is that they've been so smashed around that we've got no idea where the floor levels were. We've got the Tudor wall there coming off. Now, what we don't know is whether it's a building, a structure, or whether it's just a boundary wall. If we go back a little bit, what we're starting to see is a wall running for a flush, so it's more like a boundary wall. If we go back even further, it shows even clearer this strong wall all the way running across the front. It does suggest that that wall is no more than a boundary wall rather than a structure. Yeah, you can't really see any structure. It's, it's, it's still a bit confusing. It is, isn't it? I mean, I'd like a painting from the other side. That's for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't got one of those. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
we just don't have any evidence here to back up Jonathan's original theory for a gatehouse. Although the wall may once have been part of a larger wooden structure, for example a gallery leading to the church. But it does mean our straightforward plan for this site is unravelling in front of our eyes. Hopefully this trench behind the garden wall will find the other side of the northern wing. But just to confuse matters, geophys have discovered these anomalies in the courtyard, suggesting two completely different shapes and sizes of that northern wing. And that means we'll need to dig two more trenches to test their results. And if that's not complicated enough, we seem to have lost the east wing entirely. The archaeology and archives now suggesting it was just a boundary wall. In the midst of all this contradiction and confusion, Stuart has been fertling around the site in his own inimitable fashion. And he now believes these massive earthworks to the north of the site could be the remains of the formal Tudor gardens. It's got mortar in it, hasn't it? Are there, any, are there any bricks in it anywhere? There is a little bit further up. We've got brickwork. Slowly but surely, Stuart's evolving his own very different theory as to the whereabouts of the Grand Palace. Plus, the records show it was also at the very heart of a royal scandal. Henry was showing off Catherine Hurt. She was his trophy wife. He wanted everybody to see her. I mean, the irony is, of course, that a week later she is denounced for adultery. And, in fact, there is also evidence in the National Archives that while at Cheney's, you know, she was engaged in a liaison with Thomas Culpepper. Oh, really? Actually uh, absolutely, here? Absolutely here, yes, yes, because the, 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 the evidence against her actually mentions Cheney's. If you're approaching from that direction, you're going to approach from the back end of the church. Yeah. That's going to be the first thing you see, the rear of it. Yeah. And why would you want to approach from the back of the church? It seems just to turn its back on everything. You want to celebrate this building. Um, it's halfway through day two, and we've got almost nothing to show for it. But that suddenly changes when we get the dendro dates for the west and south wings. This bit here comes much later, in the summer of 1550. Hang on, hang on, whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> when did Henry VIII come and stay here? 1540, well, 34 and 41. 41. And we've been assuming... This isn't Henry VIII's reign, this is not part of Henry VIII's reign in that case. <laughs> we've been yeah. assuming that this is the constant, this is the reason that we came here, because yeah. we got a bit of the place where Henry VIII stayed. That's so nice. the, bu the building is elsewhere. Yeah, the buildings that uh, Henry saw are elsewhere, are elsewhere. Mm -hmm. although he did see this one behind me. So this wing on which we've based so much of our digging strategy wasn't even built until after Henry VIII's death. And that means we can turn this dig on its head, distilling a new layout for the house. And this is it. With the main entrance to the west and a grand set of lodgings to the north overlooking terraced gardens, which is where our new trench will go in. Unfortunately, it's in the most inappropriate spot on the whole site, jammed in between a wall and our portable toilets. Ah, oh, the glamour of archaeology. Our new plan may be causing headaches for the archaeologists, but it's completely transformed our understanding of the archives. This is a cracking piece of archaeology, isn't it? Thank you, Mick. It really is. <laughs> do we understand it now? I think we actually do. I think what you're looking at here is the front facade of the Royal Lodges. We think it's actually built in probably two phases. They put up one skin of bricks and then added. But f the most obvious thing are these two bay windows, one there, one there and one over there, which they've actually added on to the front of the building. So it's got a whole series of glass windows up the front of it. It really shows how important this is. And we check this out. It could have been a garderobe. Turns out that, in fact, it is just a massive bay window. Yeah. yeah. We've had glass out of here as well. Oh, so nice. Right. Anyway, yeah. once we come into the building, yeah. we've got a room on that side yeah. and a room on that side. So a partition wall down the middle. Well, it's, it's more than a partition. Look at the size of it. Of course, it's as big as, it's big as the outer wall, isn't it? <laughs> And you see here, look, you see we've got a whole series of these little niches cut into that wall. Now, I reckon that's where the flooring joists would have been. So oh, if you allow yeah. for the flooring joists yeah. and allow for the floorboards on the top, mm. I reckon that floor level is about here and you would have looked out down yeah. over yeah. the valley. So it would work out to be about 30 foot in depth and um, yeah. you could say it is literally palatial. We may not have found a Tudor ensuite bathroom, but these remains show the sheer scale of the apartments that would have greeted the royal entourage. This new layout has got one final treat in store for us. 
After careful measurement and cross-referencing with the 1585 inventory, it seems we may have stumbled across the bedchamber of a certain Henry VIII. By 1541, when Henry came here, he had a badly ulcerated leg and he wasn't as mobile. Uh, and in fact, um, he would have stayed in this building on the ground floor, not the first floor, as you know, a monarch would normally have done. Was it? Well, we think that because when Henry VIII's bed was actually given away by the second Earl of Bedford in, in 1585, it was actually on the lower floor, in the lower chamber. Now, the royal bed was absolutely huge. You didn't just bring it into the room. It was probably built inside the room and wouldn't go out through the door. It's bizarre, isn't it, that we're in this old bus, and yet at some time in history, King Henry VIII might have been just here, gazing out into the garden with his separated leg. Well, I think that's entirely possible. And this would have been just one small part of the fair lodgings that Sir John Russell had built for his royal visitors. Because wedged between the dining bus and the portable toilets, geophys have been able to confirm Stuart's suggested extent of the missing Tudor range. As you get up to the line, there's a definite response where the uh, front wall is. <laughs> We've got a clear demarcation there. Right. And that lines up perfectly. Oh, excellent. That's with Phil's the walls excavation in Phil's walls, trench yeah. going yeah. through there. Possible back wall at that point there ah, running yeah. through. Just this side of the bus. <laughs> Under the concrete. So if we hadn't <laughs> have parked the dining bus there, we might have been able to have a look at it. And yet all that now remains of this grand palace is a beautiful fraction of its former glory. This is the story of a grand medieval house turned into a palace fit for a king. Its facade further embellished with modish and very impressive bay windows by the time of Queen Elizabeth's month-long stay in 1570. And dendro dating shows that by this time they'd also added another wing to the south of the complex. In every respect, this house reflects the very pinnacle of the power and wealth of the Earls of Bedford, its Tudor owners. Hello, my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan-funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.